How are these men protecting our health? What did the steel industry borrow from lumbermen? Why is fountain pen ink packaged like this? How can a television station give its viewers college credits? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Here's a Louisville office in which the air is as clean as any to be found. The air-conditioned atmosphere entering the room is pulled through a glass fiber filter mounted like a roller towel. As each section of the filter becomes saturated with dust and grime, it is rolled down and a clean section takes its place. Not surprising to find the latest such equipment in use here, for this is the plant of American Air Filter Company in which the equipment is manufactured. The filtering element is made out of the scrap from a plant that makes automobile windows. The broken glass or cullet is dried, then melted and forced through tiny openings to become a very fine glass thread, about as thick as the strands of a spider's web. These threads or fibers are now wound up on drums into a blanket two inches thick. You have to look close to see the individual strands. Frequently, the fibers break between the die and the take-up drum, in which case the dangling end of the fiber must be led to the drum so the spinning process can continue. When about 60 pounds of fibers have been intertwined on a drum, they're cut off in the form of a blanket, six feet long and 12 feet wide. At this point, the glass is quite malleable. It can be compressed or pulled this way and that. So next, a heat treatment will fix it permanently into a springy mass which, when bent or pulled out of shape, will always return instantly to its original position. Before this is done, though, the blanket will be stretched to a length of 300 feet. The stretching is done by hand. Because of the length of the fibers, there's no danger of slivers in handling the material. As it is stretched, the filter material expands in thickness as well as in length and breadth. So now, the heat treatment. And out the other side, ready to be cut to size. The plant utilizes other scrap in addition to broken glass. For example, frames for filters used in the conventional installation are made of waste paperboard. And guess where the metal grids came from? They're the scrap from a bottle cap factory. As the frames come off one line, the pads of fiberglass come off another, cut to size perfectly for each of the various frame dimensions. Frame and pad are put together in nothing flat. Once an air filter has done its job, it cannot be cleaned for reuse. It must be thrown away. And disposable items must be inexpensive if they are to find a market. These people with their advanced production techniques and utilization of materials which, though of the best quality, would otherwise be waste, are making clean air as easy to attain as clean food and clean water. Around meatpacking plants, the saying is that they use every part of the pig but the squeal. Well, that same reluctance to let any usable product or byproduct go to waste pervades all of industry. In this case, it's a philosophy that is helping to put air filtering equipment in most of the new schools being erected, not to mention hospitals, offices, factories, buses, planes, trains, and of course, the modern home with its clean lines outside, clean air within.
Today, America's leaders of 1976 are studying in our high schools and colleges, learning what America has been, what it is now, and what it can become. The responsibility that falls on every teacher's shoulder is enormous. Industry believes each citizen should do what he can to lighten that load, to support and encourage the teacher in America, to be an active and sympathetic friend of education. Industry itself realizes its own obligations. More visibly and effectively each year, industry is becoming both the willing and welcome ally of education. Industry on Parade visits a Pennsylvania steel mill to learn how the steel industry has borrowed a page from the lumber industry book. Most of our viewers are familiar with this device called a straddle carrier. For years in lumber yards all over the country, machines like it have allowed one man to pick up a tremendous load of boards and speed off with it. Now the steel industry, which has far heavier, more awkward loads to handle, is using the same equipment worked in conjunction with forklift trucks and other materials handling equipment. It constitutes one more step in a determined program to relieve men of back-breaking physical labor. In days gone by, steel billets, bars, rods, and sheets being moved about the planter yard had to be manhandled aboard a truck or flat car, then unloaded and stacked, again by hand, at the other end of each short trip. Now, only rarely does anyone have to lay a hand on the product. Introduction of such labor-saving equipment has not put people out of jobs. Quite the contrary. During the past 15 years, employment in the steel companies has risen 25%, and widespread acquisition of the machines in all branches of industry has raised employment even faster at the companies that manufacture such devices. In this case, the Ross Division of Clark Equipment Company. On big farms, in and around factories of all kinds, or on construction jobs as here, the rugged straddle carriers are speeding the work and cutting expenses. Throughout industry, equipment that reduces sweat and strain while increasing productivity is the order of the day. Something new in the field of writing instruments. Ink cartridges for fountain pens, much like the cartridges used in ballpoint pens. This is the machine that fills the cartridges here at Waterman Pen Company in Seymour, Connecticut. All air is exhausted from the flexible containers and the vacuum thus created draws in ink from the supply tank. The open ends then are sealed and outroll the fills. Meanwhile, the pens designed for cartridge filling are being assembled. Nimble fingers join gold pen points to the parts called sections. Now the ink reservoir will be added. Not the cartridge, but the storage device that keeps the intake of air and the flow of ink in balance. The alignment of pen point and ink reservoir is critical. So this is one of many points at which magnifying lenses are used to check on the work. Now one subassembly is joined to another. Amazing how many separate parts there are to such a small article as a fountain pen. Here being added are a metal washer and coupling which lock the components in place permanently. Under a glass, pen point, ink reservoir, and feed are heat molded into perfect contact. This is one more field in which competition between companies is intense. So each manufacturer seeks constantly for ways to make his product better than the next fellow's. Here, a highly skilled worker aligns and puts the proper tension on the tines of the pen point. This assures the proper flow of ink to the writing surface. And now the pen is tested, first without ink, to see if the point slides over the paper with the necessary smoothness. Then a cartridge is inserted. This is all there is to it. Now, with ink, another test. To maintain its competitive position, Waterman spends a great deal of money on its research laboratory, 
developing not only new writing instruments like the cartridge-filled pen, but also new improved inks. Pens and inks are given exhaustive analysis, chemically and on machines like this. Writing quality is just as important as long life. So finally, the ink cartridges, the pens, and the pencils are sent on their way. The very best products the people of the company can turn out. But that doesn't mean that next year they won't come up with something even better. We Americans are always trying to find better ways of doing things. Our forefathers, who pioneered and discovered new frontiers in this country, have been supplanted by the scientists and technicians in American industry's laboratories. Every day, every week, every year, someone is discovering a new product or improving an old one which will benefit all of us. Each year, industry spends more than two and a half billion dollars in research that creates new jobs, more and better products, which help all of us to continually improve our standard of living. Meet Charles Ruffey, a radio engineer of East Lansing, Michigan. Charlie has much in common with Kay Ide, a stenographer also of East Lansing, and with thousands of other working people of Michigan, like Bob Rowe, a local druggist. What they have in common is that they're all part-time college students, thanks to television, mornings, afternoons, and evenings, in studio classrooms of Michigan State College's educational television station, WKAR-TV, Instructors teach subjects ranging from anthropology to salesmanship. Very few students are actually present in the classroom, but those participating from their homes number, as I say, in the thousands. Those who participate by television through the college's continuing education service can register for credits toward a degree. If they do, they follow the prescribed textbooks and receive by mail an outline of the course and written assignments which are mailed back to the college for grading. Michigan industry is strongly behind the University of the Air because it extends educational opportunities in the state and permits working people to complete their educations regardless of what shift they may be on at the office or factory. Many of the students who take a course by television, like Charles, Kay, and Bob, band together informally and follow the lectures at each other's homes. This way, if one of them misses a point, the others can usually fill him in. Questions submitted by mail are answered promptly at the continuing education service. Students seeking credits must come to the college at the end of the course to take their final examinations. To